whenever something bad happens on earth, man seems to always look for a way out. A way so they can still do what they do, but do it without being affected. In 1755, there was a great earthquake in Europe, in the city of Lisbon, it was largely affected. And when this earthquake struck, it was a holy day, and the churches were full. And in the church services, they used candles as part of their worship, and so there was many candles lit, and as this earthquake happened the buildings came tumbling down and as a result the candles that were alight caused a fire. So those that survived the earthquake they now had to deal with a fire and as they were dealing with a the fire they decided that they would go to the ocean shore and as they went to the ocean shore they had to deal with a tsunami. And it reminds me of, of human reactions. When something bad happens, we look to run away to something else. The earthquake comes, we've survived, but then there's a fire. So we leave the fire only to find ourselves destroyed in a tsunami. After the New Zealand earthquake, many people have left New Zealand to come and find places to live other than Christchurch and that is the nature of man. We read in the Bible in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1 that when the king of the north comes to his end and none will help him at that time Michael shall stand up and at that time there will be a time of trouble such as was not since there was a nation. It's going to be a horrific time. But it says that at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that is written in the book. So according to the book of Daniel, the only deliverance we will ever, anyone will ever receive from the trouble to come upon this world is to have their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's interesting when the financial crisis happened and as inflation went, people started scratching their heads, where should we invest our money? They realised that government bonds weren't secure. They realised that the banks are not secure. They realised the stock market wasn't secure. And as, in, as inflation happened, they realised that even paper currency wasn't secure. So people turned to gold. Because gold has always been the stabiliser for all these problems. But it is written in the Bible that gold will be worth nothing. Gold will be cankered. And they'll crawl into the, to the caves and they'll throw their gold to the bats and to the moles. Because what's gold going to do? Is it going to feed your stomach? And so there's only one place to secure your investments. And that is in heaven. In the bank of heaven. Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5 and verse 18 talks about woe to those that desire the day of the Lord. Because it says, to what end is it for you? It's a question. What is the day of the Lord going to be like for you? And it goes, it says, the day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Now it gives a comparison. It says, as if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him. Or he went into a house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. So here we have the lions and people are running from them. I was talking to a a friend of mine in Europe, and he was seeing the disasters and he said, I need to get out of Europe, I need to be in a safe country. I said, well, the only safe country there is, is the heavenly country and you better have your name on the roll. 
Because you can come to Australia, you can go to any other country, and there will be problems. You can run from the lion, but you'll meet the bear. And if you run from the bear and you get into the house and you lean upon the wall and go, whew, that was close, and then the serpent will bite you. Because you can't be saved. No one is safe with their name out of that book. Read with me in Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, we read here in the prophetic writings which have never erred. Anyone wants to test the prophecies of the Bible, go through history, it is 100% accurate. Therefore, that which shall come is also accurate. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Verse 2, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Here we get a glimpse of some communication among the heavenly hosts. And here is commissioned angels to prevent the destruction upon the world. And they are preventing it for one purpose and one purpose only. Because they are about to let the winds go. And the other angel comes and says, hold it, stop until we have done a job, this whole world's activities is hinging upon this work. And this work is sealing God's people in their foreheads. Having the seal of the living God to consolidate them in the name, to have their names in the book of life. Because it is written that your name can be removed. So this book needs to be sealed up, it needs to be completed and this is the time we're living in. There is the only safety in this planet is to have the seal of the living God. If you read in Revelation chapter 14, we see where this, this seal, a little bit more detail written in their forehead. And it says in verse 1, Revelation 14 and verse 1, and it says, And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him, a hundred and forty and four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads. As we read Revelation chapter 14 verse 1, it's in stark contrast with Revelation chapter 13. Would you like to read with me? Revelation 13, and it says in verse 15, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And as John saw this, he then saw... 144,000 not having the mark of the beast, but having the Father's name in their forehead. And His name is what? What is His name? You can read this in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 14, 15. Isaiah 57. Verse 15, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is Holy. I dwell in a high and holy place, and with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So here we have upon this mountain, this high and lofty place, there is the Lamb. And his name is holy. And there is with him 144,000 having the name in their foreheads. Holiness unto the Lord. 
You can read with me. In Exodus 28 and verse 36. Exodus 28, verse 36 to 38. And here we see some typology of this holiness. Here, the priest, which typifies the priest that would be unto the Lord. It says, And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, and grave upon it, like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace, that it may be upon the mitre, and upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquities of the holy things, which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts. And it shall be always upon his forehead, that they may be accepted before God. Here we have this holiness unto the Lord upon the forehead. That everything that is done will be accepted. God will only accept your service if He has your forehead, your mind, your heart. God wants your heart. It says, my son... Give me your heart. That's what he wants. If we decide to give him our money and do not give him our heart, it will not be accepted. Because it says, It shall always be upon the forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. The beast, the image of the beast... This world doesn't mind what sort of service it gets. It will have your mind, it will have your heart, but if you just do it service, at least it's happy. God is not happy with anything short than the whole heart. God won't accept it otherwise. Are you holy gods? Is every part of you gods? Because if it is not, then all our missionary endeavours, every time that we give to the Lord... If our whole heart isn't there, it is an abomination unto him. The great commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, and with all your might, and with all your soul, with every particle that you have. Holiness unto the Lord. Let us look in a verse in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13 through 16. And it says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. And hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which calleth you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Did Jesus Christ love the Lord with all his heart? And are we to do the same? This is what it takes to be on Mount Zion. This is what it takes to avoid the calamities that will come upon this earth. This is what it will take to save your own soul from the destruction of this world. To be holy gods. Because at that time, he would deliver the people. Everyone that is found written in the book will be delivered. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 24... Uh, Hebrews 12 and verse 14 rather. Hebrews 12 verse 14 it says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. To have peace and to have holiness... These things 
have to have a place in the mind to be able to exist. Peace is a state of being. Holiness is a state of being. And when it says that the name holiness is to be on the forehead, that means that your heart, your frontal lobe of the brain, the place where the thoughts are cherished, the treasure, as it's written, that where a man's treasure is, there will be his heart. So what you treasure, those thoughts that you hold on to, that's you. Because it is written, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So holiness, then, is something that is to be cherished in your heart. In the most, the, the biggest treasure of your whole life is to be like Jesus. And you're to hold that like you would hold any earthly treasure that the wealthy like to do. We're very good at holding on to our possessions and we'll, we'll do anything to avoid danger. But will we do this to avoid eternal danger? And not just eternal danger, but also physical danger too. Will we do this? I read a quote from Upward Look, page 89, paragraph 5. And it says, Never forget that thoughts work out actions, repeated actions form habits, and habits form character. So where does it start? Right in the thoughts. If we dwell upon holiness, perfection, some people just say, well, it's an impossibility, so we don't think about it. If you don't think about it, it is an impossibility. It'll never happen. Not even when Jesus comes, it won't happen. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So we n must never forget that thoughts work out actions. So if you have holiness as the treasure of your life, the holiness of Jesus Christ, what will it work out? The actions of Jesus Christ. And those actions, if allowed to become habitual, will form your character. And when the character of Christ is perfectly reflect, reflected, He will come to claim His own. He will deliver His people that are found written in His book. I read another statement from Mind, Character and Personality. First Mind, Character and Personality. 285 paragraph 1. We need a constant sense of the ennobling power of pure thoughts. The only security for any soul is right thinking. The only security. Do you lock your doors? Do you lock your car? We bolt everything up, but have you bolted your soul up? Are you prepared to meet the great crisis with security? Or the chance to lose everything? Because if your house is all locked and it hasn't been burgled, but you lose your own soul, what point is your house? It avails nothing. We need a constant sense of the ennobling power of pure thought. The only security for any soul is right thinking. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The power of self-restraint strengthens by exercise that which at first seems difficult. By constraint, re repetition grows easy until right thoughts and actions become habitual. So in this proposal to you to secure yourself, you must have right thinking. Is it easy to control your thoughts? We have an adversary who doesn't want anybody saved. And that adversary has vowed himself to war against Christ and all his followers. 
And we want to look at this because in this war, who has already obtained the victory? Jesus Christ has obtained the victory. He has developed a pure character. How did he do that? By pure thought. Desire of Ages, page 123, in verse 3, we see here this victory that Jesus Christ gained. Desire of Ages, 123, paragraph 3, The Prince of this world cometh, said Jesus, and hath nothing in me. There was in him nothing that responded to Satan's sophistries. He did not consent to sin, not even by a thought did he yield to temptation. So it may be with us. Do you believe that? So it may be with us. Christ's humanity was united with divinity. Here Satan comes and Satan tempted him. And we read... That there were thoughts and feelings that annoyed him. But yet he did not sin even by a thought. It says in Second Mind, Character and Personality, page 432, it says, We should preserve the strict chastity in thought and word and deportment. Let us remember that God sets our secret sins in the light of his countenance. Is thought a secret sin? Does other people know you're doing it? No, it's nothing you do in the closet, it's what you do here. That's a secret sin, but you know it's open before the countenance of God. And it goes on, it says, There are thoughts and feelings suggested and aroused by Satan to annoy even the best of men. But if they are not cherished... If they are repulsed as hateful, the soul is not contaminated with guilt, and no other is defiled by the influence. Oh, that we each might become a saver of life unto life to those around us. So here, there are thoughts and feelings that Satan can arouse. But yet, Christ did not even sin by a thought. So, if thought can be aroused by Satan, how can Jesus then not sin even by a thought? Does that mean that he had no temptation by Satan in that realm? Do you ever get tempted by some thoughts that pop into your head? So, was Jesus Christ tempted in all points like as we are? Some people don't believe that. They, they believe the, the scripture just because they don't want to disbelieve it, but really they do disbelieve it. Read with me. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 and starting in verse 15 through to 17. Love not the world... Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever." Here we see everything in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. These things don't come from the Father. They come from the world. And it's written that Jesus Christ has overcome the world. Not even by a thought did he sin. Not even by a thought. James chapter 1 and verse 14. 
It says, every man is tempted. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Temptation is only temptation from the lust of the flesh. And Satan has the ability to create thoughts and feelings from the flesh to annoy even the best of men. And yet, when those thoughts are not cherished, it's not sin. Because it says, when it has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And then when sin has finished, it bringeth forth death. There is this battle going on here. This is the battle line between good and evil. Where is it? In the realm of the thoughts. Because you can have a thought that is wrong and it's not sin. And then you can have a thought that is cherished and it is sin. So we have a realm here between the thought coming in and the thought being cherished, that fine line, that is our battle line. We often worry, you know, we shouldn't be doing this and we shouldn't be doing that. And it is true, but you know, we shouldn't be thinking this and we shouldn't be thinking that. That's where the battle lies, my friends. I was greatly amused when I saw a depiction of the battle in heaven. And they depicted it as if the angels drew out their swords and they were just chopping each other up. And they were fighting with, with, with muscle. And there they are in the heavenly courts as depicted in this sad imagery. And there they are fighting away in a physical manner. Is that the battle that we're in? Is that the battle that was in heaven? Has the heavenly battle come to earth? It sure has. And did you see Christ and Satan wrestling in that wilderness? You did, but not in the flesh. You saw them battling the battle of the mind. And the war in heaven is not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. But you know, Armageddon is a physical battle. Not a spiritual battle. We get our wires crossed. Because the people that show this imagery of the celestial beings fighting then show that the battle of Armageddon is just all spiritual. It's all backwards. Right here, the battle line is your mind. The battlefield is that gap between your flesh in your body and your heart. Those two things. A thought can come in, and is it in your heart yet? No, but when it goes in your heart, then that's what you are. Because as you think in the heart, that's what you like. So Jesus Christ kept his heart holy for God. Holiness unto the Lord. And so the thought that came still came to the central nervous system. It was still there, but it did not come in to the heart. And you can see the image there, that line. That's the battle line between the frontal lobe and the rest of the body. And Satan can create thoughts that will pop into the intelligent part of your brain and now you have to make a choice what are you going to do with that and you have a, a firewall if you like a wall of defense and in this wall of defense there is judgment and you make a decision what you're going to do with that thought you are either going to expel it or you're going to let it in you're the doorkeeper what are you going to do and if we let such evil thoughts into the heart, is it holy for God? It's not holy for God. And so this is where the battle line is. Satan is trying to get into your heart. And Christ is trying to get into your heart. Satan forces and Christ knocks. 
I stand at the door and knock. If you will hear my voice, let me in. Satan doesn't work, work in those lines. Read with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. And we'll read what the Bible tells us is the battle. And this battle is waged until probation closes. When the sealing happens, he that is holy, let him be holy still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. Some people believe that after probation closes in the, in the seven last plagues, that there will be a battle of Armageddon between good and evil. But it's in a time where those that are wicked won't be good and those that are good won't be wicked. So what's the battle? It's a physical battle, my friends. Don't let people confuse you on that topic. This battle is waging from the war in heaven to the close of probation. And then it's a different battle after that. We can read here in Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. There's the battle. To capture the thought and get rid of it. If we can focus on that, everything else will come in its train. If you just think it's all about what's going on inside of here, because that's what Christ taught. You know, you might not run next door and sleep with the woman next door, but if it goes on in here, it's the exact same thing before God. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. This battle line was waged in the mind of Christ. The f flesh against the spirit. And who won? Jesus Christ conquered and he is offering to you and I the victory that comes by the word of God. As Brother Cameron put very beautifully in this morning worship, it is the words that we need to hold into that heart. The words and that's what you are. And if you are holding the words of God, then you can be like Jesus Christ. So in this warfare, you notice the wicked, when Satan achieves, look how the Bible describes the wicked. In Psalms, Psalms 10 and verse 4, the wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Do you have some thoughts of God? Or is he in all your thoughts? You know, the Bible says the wicked... God is not in all his thoughts. That's all Satan needs to get into your heart just a little bit of sin. Just a little bit. But Jesus says the devil cometh and hath nothing in there. There's nothing of the devil in the heart of Jesus Christ. In that frontal lobe, nothing. That firewall, that wall of judgment, that standard prevailed against the evil one. And so as Christ has conquered, actually I'll read another text in Romans. Romans chapter 8 and verse 5 and we'll see how this spiritual warfare we really need to focus on what it is that we need to fight. And when we understand what it is to fight, then we'll know what things to avoid. It says, For they that are in the flesh, Romans 8 verse 5, For they that are in the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. So we have the carnal nature. And if we are in the flesh, that means that the heart, the frontal lobe, contains the things that happen inside of the body as treasure. It's its treasure. It loves it. 
but it says, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So you're, if you're of God, what do you mind? What's in your mind? God. This is the difference. And it says, for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. The brain nerves, which communicate with the entire system, are the only medium through which heaven can communicate to man and affect his innermost life. Through the brain nerves. When people meditate and in prayer, the frontal lobe, when it is scanned, is very active. God speaks directly to this part. And Satan, via the flesh, speaks to the same part, but he has to come through the flesh. If he doesn't come through the flesh, it's nothing. Because every man is tempted when he is drawn away of the devil or of his own flesh, of his own lust. It has to be something inside of you to ever achieve entering inside of that unless it is God. So we have God is trying to occupy your throne, your mind. And Satan comes via the flesh. Very important for us to understand that. Because if we understand how God accesses my heart and how the devil will access my heart, then we will know how to gain the victory. And when we gain the victory, you are sealed with the seal of the living God. You are holy, His, holy unto the Lord. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12. Christ won the battle. And some people believe because Christ won the battle, then game over, we all can just be cheery. Don't worry about anything. Christ has won the battle. Is that what the Bible tells us? It says in Revelation chapter 12, it says in verse 12, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and for the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. He lost the battle with Christ. He had no more access to heaven. Christ won. And now the doom of the devil as is sealed. And now, should we all celebrate here on earth? Is that what the Bible tells us? Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Woe. Christ won the battle. But we're still in the heat of it. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because the devil has come down, having great power. It says in verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast out of the earth, what did he do? He persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Seeing Satan has lost the battle, he is very angry, very angry. And he is going to persecute the church of Jesus Christ. And it says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman. He was angry. And he went to make war and was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's open war. War against what? War against your thoughts. That's what Satan has decided to do. He knows that it's no point trying to get you to physically sin. 
He wants you to think sin. And if you think it, you will do it. And if you do it again, it will be your habit. And if it is your habit, it will be your character. So here we have this warfare, not against the membership of the church, not against numbers, not against um, cancer and all these things that people are fighting today. It's against your thoughts. Are you prepared for such a battle? Do you even understand what's involved in this battle? Are you losing this battle or are you winning this battle? Because to be sealed in the forehead is very simple. It means you are holy gods. That's what it means. To be sealed with the Father's name in the forehead. You, you are totally gods and you're locked in. He that is holy, let him be holy still. But seeing that the sealing hasn't finished, we're in grave danger. We're in grave danger that by thought we will sin. And if by thought Satan can get you to sin, then you're losing the battle. But if you understand the battle, if you understand by what means it is that Satan is going to come through your flesh to affect that mind, to break down the wall, if you understand what means he, he has, then you'll be equipped to meet him. Because it is written that we should not be ignorant of his devices. And so our next study is going to look at his devices. If you're serious, if you really want security in this world, you need that seal. It's the only thing guaranteed only thing to get you through. You can change countries, you can fly wherever you like, you can build a concrete bunker and you'll still be destroyed. Guaranteed. You can put your money wherever you like, it's going to canker. Guaranteed. This is the only source of security on this planet. The seal of the living God. This is very important that we understand what his devices are so we know what to shun because it is as simple as this as a man thinks in his heart so is he that's it that is as simple as it is and so all satan has to do is get some thoughts in your heart that's all he has to do and he's won his banner needs to be planted right there in your frontal lobe. And once it's planted there, great for him. And his means of doing that are different to the means in which God will plant his throne there. Because originally in the creation, that frontal lobe was God's throne. And Satan says that I want to be like the Most High. I want my throne where God's throne is. And so if he can get it in the height of your personality, then he's happy. So my next study will be to look at these devices. And I pray that we can have clarity of thought to understand them. Is my prayer. Amen.